Welcome to Liberty Me Live. We're here for the repeat of the first episode of Economics and Science Fiction with Dr. Lucas Engelhart. Uh, we had the first, the first installment last week, uh, which we're repeating now, but unfortunately there was a, a, cata a catastrophic systems failure with Adobe Connect regarding the recording, so we lost it completely, source file corrupted. And we're going to do it again because we thought it was just that cool. So we're glad to have you. I, I know some of you, since we've opened this up uh, to the public for tonight, some of you might not be Liberty Me members. Welcome. You can start a free trial if you would like to check out more sessions here at Liberty Me Live or the other things we have to offer at Liberty.me. But uh, without, uh, I'll uh, go ahead and get to tonight's episode. Uh, Dr. Lucas Engelhart is a professor at Kent State's Kent State University's Stark campus, and he is a sci-fi geek like me. Uh, what can I say? Uh, and I think that's awesome. And if you don't, then you're probably not here in this class right now. So it doesn't matter. So we're all in this together. We're going to be talking tonight about. My favorite episode of all of Star Trek, Treachery, Faith, in the Great River from Star Trek Deep Space Nine. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to Lucas Engelhart. Thanks. Um, so I'd like to start by talking some about um, economics and science fiction more generally um, before we get really into the heart of this particular episode. Um, but before we can do that, I want to talk about economics and fiction more generally as well. Right, so let's start there. Um, I really want to think in terms of um, what Ludwig von Mises calls praxeology. Um, praxeology is just the study of human action, right? That is the fact that we apply means to attain ends. We have resources at our disposal, and we use them to try to accomplish various goals that we have. Now, this is actually very close to the modern mainstream economist view that economics is really about constrained optimization, where I'm trying to achieve some maximum level of satisfaction, say, um, from consuming various goods, but I only have a certain amount of time in which I can work and earn, and earn an income or use that time for leisure. Uh, that's really more or less saying the same thing. I have this set of resources and I'm trying to accomplish um, some set of goals with them. Um, now, for those that were here last week and for those that weren't, uh, my wife is a um, fiction writer, uh, specifically kind of dark fairy tales is more what she does. Uh, so we have lots of discussions about you know, how economics relates to fiction, and what is fiction, what is a story, what does all this mean? Um, and really, fiction does center on this idea of story, typically. Um, stories involving a protagonist trying to overcome some kind of obstacle right, in order to achieve some goal. Now we can immediately see this feels very much like human action, right? We're, we have resources at our disposal, we're trying to achieve some goal that isn't immediately and automatically satisfied. And so really, stories, in a sense, are just little fictional case studies um, in praxeology, showing how people do, in fact, act right, in order to achieve our goals. Um, Bill Johnson specifically suggests that a story, is, a story is really a series of events that describe the fulfilling of a human need, right, which really ties in very well with this view of praxeology, um, of which economics is just one branch of this overall study of human action. And so then thinking more about economics and science or speculative fiction. Uh, there are a few ways in which these two areas seem to overlap or connect with each other. Um, one is in methodological similarities. That is, the method that we undertake as economic theorists is really we're just posing these what-if questions and then seeking reasonable, believable answers. And the same thing is absolutely true in speculative fiction, where we're making some assumptions about the way the world could be and then seeing what that means for society and for people trying to fulfill their goals. And so the two really are basically doing the same thing. Um, the topics are different, kind of the underlying assumptions and the approach is a little bit different, but it's basically doing the same set of steps, right? asking the what if question, making some assumptions, and then working it out to come up with a believable answer. But at the same time, both of these, while we know that a lot of what we're doing is technically fictional, um, when you look at economic theorizing, we tend to make a lot of assumptions that we know aren't true. Um, even going back to Ludwig von Mises, one construction he uses, they call the evenly rotating economy, 
where he imagines what would the world be like if there were no uncertainty. And if basically the same thing happened day in and day out. Now we know this is obviously not the way things work, uh, but he uses this to illustrate where interest comes from, how interest is different from profit, and so it highlights something about the real world, even though we're creating this fictional universe. Of course, that's exactly the same thing that speculative fiction or science fiction does. Right? We create this fictional universe, but in the end, it's telling us something about the real world in which we live. And making comments about, say, the, so the society and the social ills that we're facing at the moment. Another point of connection between economics and science fiction seems to be that there's kind of a shared fan base. Uh, amongst libertarians, like those of us here at liberty.me, uh, we know that there's a great love for things like Atlas Shrugged or Firefly, these very liberty-oriented um, themes, which are really science fiction. Right? Uh, at the same time, we know on the other end of the spectrum, Paul Krugman, in no way libertarian, would shudder at the thought of being identified as one also is a great science fiction fan, uh, specifically his big connection to the, to the foundation novels from Isaac Asimov, I think now are pretty well known. Um, if I recall correctly, he even wrote the introduction or a preface or something like that um, to one of the editions of the foundation novels. Um, I actually just finished the foundation novels this past week, uh, and they do ask all sorts of interesting questions about um, social science and what it's capable of, our ability to predict the future given that human beings are human beings. Uh, so it's really um, an interesting novel, thinking about it as a social scientist. Okay. So we see this shared fan base on either end of the spectrum. Okay. Um, another point that economics and science fiction have in common um, is this idea of forecasting. Um, as an economist, I'm always very hesitant to give any kinds of forecasts at all. Um, I'm much better after things happen saying why they happened rather than saying what is going to happen. There's a lot of uncertainty in the real world. Um, but at the same time, we know that economists are expected to give forecasts on occasion. Um, science fiction, similarly, uh, it's not really trying to make predictions, but it really kind of is trying to make predictions. And Asimov is one that's very clear about this. Uh, he has this um, collection of short stories, um, Robot Dreams it's called. It's a great collection. And, and in the introduction to it, he goes through and analyzes each of his stories and really evaluates how he did um, predicting where things would go. And there were some things that he did very well, um, managed to predict things like um, there's this effect when people are spacewalking, this kind of sense of euphoria that astronauts get during a spacewalk. And that's something he predicted. Um, but then there are other things that he got totally wrong. Um, he totally missed the fact that we're going to be able to miniaturize computers. So when he's dealing with powerful computers, there are these huge computers operating underneath cities and the like, uh, doing things that probably I could do now with my iPod. Right? So he totally missed the boat on that one. And but he makes very clear, he's not trying to make predictions, but at the same time, he recognizes science fiction is making predictions. And in these predictions, you can see two very clear paths um, that science fiction goes down. Uh, one being the utopian path, which really focuses on the positive sides of human and rational potential, the things that we are capable of uh, if we really do what is right and good. Uh, Star Trek being the most obvious example of kind of taking this utopian approach, saying what would things look like if we solved a lot of our problems? Now then there's the dystopian approach goes naturally the opposite direction, focusing more on the negative sides of humanity and what we're capable of. Soylent Green being the most obvious example of that, we can come up with loads of others. Um, Soylent Green, actually, I have to admit, I've never actually seen the entire movie, I've seen scenes from it. Um, but I did read the book, A Make Room, Make Room, which is a very good book. Uh, that's, it's good stuff, but it's still very, very disutopian, uh, um, dystopian. Nowadays, I think probably Hunger Games would be one of the most obvious cases of dystopian fiction out there at the moment. Uh, yeah, it proves how much of an economist I am when I you know, watch the movies for Hunger Games and say, you know, this really proves we shouldn't have the government determine how to distribute the food supply. Yeah. I kind of feel bad for my wife. She, she knows, as you do, I'm sure, that everything is really a documentary about economics. And so now let's get more toward this episode. And we'll think about the world of Star Trek. So what is happening? What is this science fiction universe in which we're hopping into? First, very importantly, um, Earth has really straightened out all of its issues. Right? It's things like nationalism, racism, poverty, and all of that have really been solved. 
Um, that's one of the great things that Gene Roddenberry did, even with the original series, was he decided, well, let's, let's take and put a Russian on there. Even though we're in the middle of the Cold War, things are looking very, very bad between the U.S. and Russia, and what our relationships are like, let's go ahead and put somebody on there with a Russian accent, just to communicate that we're going to get over this. Uh, or let's bring in um, a, an African-American woman and give her a prominent place there on the bridge right, to show that we're going to get over these issues, we're going to grow past it. And so it's really taking this utopian view of where we can go as human beings. Now, with regard to poverty and solving these issues, um, economically, probably the most important thing in the Star Trek universe is the replicator. Uh, the replicator basically makes most actual production and trade unnecessary. It's, a wall, it's in the wall, there's this hole. You walk up to it, you say what you want, and it will produce it. How it does it, I don't know. I'm not really an, a real scientist. I, I don't know. I, I assume it's basically a 3D printer that operates on some kind of nuclear level, right? so it can take the oxygen, nitrogen, atmosphere there and make whatever you want out of it. Right? So I can walk over and say, I need a new dress shirt, and it will make a new dress shirt appear. Right? Or I would like tea, Earl Grey hot, and there is my tea, Earl Grey hot, in this very nice mug. And so I don't actually really have to do any work to produce anything at this point. Since pretty much everybody, it seems, has access to replicators, nobody really has to focus their time on trying to produce things, nor do you have to trade to get anything, typically. Anything I want, I walk up to the replicator and I ask for it. So without trade, being a part of the economy, money is also basically absent. Now, this is something that's made very clear in Star Trek IV, The Voyage Home, where Captain Kirk and the original crew they come back in time to the 1980s, suspiciously the exact year in which it was being filmed. Right? So they show, the, show up there in the 1980s, and part of the early part of the plot is them actually having to get money so they can operate in our society, because it's not something that they use anymore. It's, it's really unnecessary as they don't have to trade, so money is pointless. Right? Um, also within Star Trek, as you watch the series, you'll see that stories really focus primarily on military personnel, um, or Starfleet. We don't see very much of civilian life. Uh, the only cases I can think of where we actually see civilians and what they're doing would be, we know that Captain Picard of The Next Generation's brother, we know that he runs a, a, it appears to be a, a winery and vineyards and the like, um, we know that Captain Sisko's father runs a restaurant, and his son is a writer. That's all we know of what civilians are doing. Uh, it appears then that while replicated food can sustain you, it may not taste as good, so there's still room for restaurants. I, I don't know. I, so it's not obvious exactly what civilians are doing uh, in much of Star Trek. And that's basically the case with this episode, too. We don't see a lot of civilian life. Uh, very important to this episode would be the race of the Ferengi. Uh, the Ferengi, when they were originally designed, right, they're um, described as being kind of this very mercantilist, the worst of the old New England merchants, I believe was the phrase that was used. Uh, they're very profit-driven, and they were meant in, the, in their original introduction to be a serious threat to the Federation. Uh, narratively, this just didn't work. Uh, it ends up, I think it's mostly because of what they look like, if you look at them, they basically have two prominent features. Okay, three prominent features. Uh, the scary one would be their sharp teeth. Okay, sharp teeth, that's kind of monstrous and scary. And the other two would be they have these really exaggerated heads that are really big. That, that strikes people more as funny and kind of comical rather than threatening. And also the big ears are exceptionally prominent. Again, this is more clownish. It's not really a threatening thing. Okay, so. Fairly quickly, we see the writers of Star Trek back off of the Ferengi being an actual threat toward being just kind of a comical, profit-driven system that they use kind of to parody right, what the profit-driven system works like. Uh, but this, nonetheless, it plays a very important role and a very useful role uh, when we look at today's episode. And so the culture of the Ferengi is really driven by profit. Uh, they have more or less their scripture is the rules of acquisition. It's just a set of rules for how they acquire money. And it includes things like you know, peace is good for business, war is good for business, once you have their money, you never give it back. It's, it's not entirely the same as rational self-interest might be. I could imagine 
there are cases where it is actually good business practice to give your customers back their money. Right? But it's supposed to at least be profit driven in some way, so they are interested in acquiring money and are used to thinking in these entrepreneurial terms. What does it take through trade for me to get what I want? And that's really the only way we can get profit is through trade, through selling things. And so um, to give some more context about DS9 in particular, uh, here there might be some spoilers. The show ended in 1999, so I feel like I'm not going to feel that bad about spoiling anything. Uh, Deep Space Nine, what it is, it is a space station uh, located near a wormhole. Uh, on the other side of this wormhole, uh, it's a very important one because it's the only known stable wormhole uh, in existence in the galaxy that they found. Right, so there's the stable wormhole that's connecting the Alpha Quadrant, where we're located, right, to the Gamma Quadrant, which is the home of the Dominion. The Dominion, uh, we discover, is a very rigidly hierarchical society. It's this empire where there's one species that is at the top, we call them the Founders, in the middle, we, we have the Vorta, which are kind of the middle administrators, um, diplomats, and, and the like. And then on the ground, we have the Jem'Hadar, who are the soldiers that really do have the menial work of fighting the battles and the like. Right. Right, so we have right, those three levels, and it's very rigid in the hierarchy. We'll get into some of the reason for that and some of how that contrasts with the way the Federation works um, a little bit later in the talk. So the Dominion and the Federation are at war. Uh, the Dominion, not shockingly, is trying to spread as empires tend to do, and spreading through the wormhole, trying to attack the Federation and the free peoples in the Alpha Quadrant. Now, at this point, there was a battle that um, occurred. Some damage has been done to the station and also its resident ship, the Defiant. Uh, the Defiant was introduced, I think, season three or four, something like that, of DS9, uh, when they found they could tell more stories if they actually introduced a way to get off the station. Right, so the Defiant has been um, damaged in some way. We need a new part to fix the Defiant. And that really kind of sets up what's going to be happening. Uh, now, in Star Trek's universe, right, uh, we're going to really be looking at the theme of barter. Right? Um, Treachery, Faith in the Great River, this episode, really the one storyline that I'm going to focus mostly on is really all about barter and how you have to do things if you can't just walk up to the hole in the wall and get what you want immediately. Right? But because of replicators, as we already mentioned, Right, everyone is basically materially self-sufficient. And so we see very little trade. Right? Money is basically non-existent for the most part in Star Trek's universe. Okay. So what the storyline really highlights, I think, um, is the role of money in our economy that is monetary, where we do have to trade very frequently, because I can't just walk up to a hole in the wall and get a new shirt or get dinner and the like. Okay. So that's really kind of the theme here. By Taking money out of the equation, we can see what money does here in the real world. Um, now, Star Trek's economy is a little bit weird. Um, I already mentioned Replicator several times, and it seems like they can produce basically anything. So we end up with very little trade material goods. Um, so no medium of exchange, no money, it's not going to serve much purpose. But it ends up that Replicators do have a limitation. Um, that limitation is that they're incapable of producing plot devices. And we see this regularly time after time in the series. So, okay, we need this special vaccine, but it's too tricky. We can't just replicate it. So there's this race against the clock for us to try to get the materials we need to get the vaccine before everyone on the ship is infected with whatever the disease happens to be. Or we need this special part, but it's too intricate or too large, or for some reason we just can't replicate it. So we're going to have to do something else in order to get what we want. All right, so whenever it's important to plot, I suppose, then we start seeing that, yeah, we do, in fact, need to do some sort of trade or, or production or something like this. And so the problem here, um, the client needs a graviton stabilizer. Being an important plot device, it's incapable to replicate it. And it ends up graviton stabilizers, for whatever reason, appear to be on back order. Right, so what are we going to do? We need this Graviton Stabilizer soon, in the next couple days. It sounds like we're probably not going to be able to get it for a couple weeks. So how do we solve the problem? Now here I think we see this great conflict between Chief O'Brien, a Starfleet officer from Earth, maybe from Ireland, yeah, that's rather obvious, and Nog, the Ferengi, who has now just joined Starfleet. They have very different perspectives, right, based on the culture they come from. 
O'Brien, growing up on Earth in Starfleet, basically accepts whether this rationing system we have to rely on right, to get those things that we can't replicate is basically final. Right? So he just has decided that he's doomed. There's no way that he can fulfill the captain's commands. It's just impossible. Like the quartermaster said, it's not available for a couple weeks. It's not available for a couple weeks. That's the way it is. Right? Nog, on the other hand, right, being a Ferengi, is very accustomed to thinking about trade and looking for a better, more entrepreneurial way to get what he wants. Right? He understands for me to get what I want, well, one way we could get it is to just wait on a waiting list. The other way is to go out and find out what I have that someone else wants and find some way to trade to get what I want. Being something that appears to be totally outside um, even Chief O'Brien's mindset is a possibility. And so it's really watching like, Nog's plan then. Chief O'Brien saying to Nog, fine, give it a shot. Right? We'll, we'll see what happens. Right, so a few insights that come out of the storyline. Uh, the first insight is looking at different types of resources. Right? Because it ends up in the monetary economy in which we live, right, the resources that we're really used to thinking about and that really matter to us would be money and things that I can use to get money. Right? So like my time, I can work and use that to get money, or I have various items that I might be able to sell or make to sell so that I can get money. Money really being the center of how trade happens. In this mostly non-monetary system, Nog realizes right, scarcity is still real. Right? But we still have only a certain set of resources and that we have to allocate them somehow. Under this rationing system, right, the way they're going to get allocated is going to be what the quartermaster says, right? or according to the quartermaster's whims. So what we need to do is make sure the quartermaster likes us so that we're at the top of the waiting list. Right? So what we need to do is find resources that will help us move to the top of the list, that is, that will help us satisfy the quartermaster, right? get, it, get him to like us somehow, right? so that he can make things happen a little bit faster. And so we know that in a system based on prices, the world we live in, money or monetizable goods are very important. In this other system, it looks like relationships have now become much more important. Um, a second insight is really the role that information plays in markets. In a monetary economy where markets are fairly thick, um, by which we mean we have lots of buyers and lots of sellers in any market, so it's fairly easy for you to find somebody selling what you want to buy or find somebody that's willing to buy what you want to sell. Specific information about things really isn't essential. I don't have to know any of the details about how this bottle of water was bottled or where it came from. Sure, maybe print it on the bottle somewhere, but I don't particularly care. All I know is that when I go to the grocery store, it's sitting there on the shelf, I can pick it up, I can drink it, it will satisfy my needs. That's all I need to know. I don't need to know all of the details of where it started from. And this is really related to a concept called the division of knowledge, which was introduced by Friedrich Hayek. Um, Hayek suggests that this price system allows us right, to undertake the division of knowledge, where each of us is only concerned with a very small amount of the total information in the economy. And we're even, say, thinking about the university that you know, pays my salary. They don't need to know everything about my life. All they need to know is, am I doing a reasonable job and am I willing to continue doing that reasonable job for what they're willing to pay me? If the answer is yes, then we're okay. It really doesn't matter to them exactly what my needs are in terms of clothing and food and shelter and various electronic devices and what have you. It doesn't matter to them. It's so they can divide up the knowledge that they care about and only focus on a very small amount of the total information in the economy. Right. Similarly, I don't have to worry about the sources of every single thing I buy. It's, it's not a huge concern to me. All I have to know is, is the, is the price right? right? Can I get the good that I want for a price that I'm willing to pay? That's it. Right. So this division of knowledge allows each of us to focus in a very small area and allows us to do a lot more. Rather than if, say I had to know everything about everything I consumed in order to feel good about doing it, I couldn't do nearly as much as I can not having to know as much. Yeah. Right, so in this monetary economy, with thick markets, specific information about things really isn't essential. Once we remove money from the system, that takes prices away too, which means now specific information becomes much more vital. Right, so I really think the first trade that happens in this episode when you watch it 
is Nog getting to know the quartermaster on some kind of personal level in exchange for getting information about where the graviton stabilizer might be. And that is Nog's first exchange. It was not even a material thing, but because it was important to him that he find out, okay, fine, you don't have a graviton stabilizer, but where is it? There isn't any one central store I can go to and just pick a graviton stabilizer off the shelf. This is something that doesn't happen in the Star Trek universe. So now I have to find out where the thing is. Uh, this is actually a reversion, going, going back to Hayek. Hayek distinguishes between two different types of societies, and he suggests that a lot of what has been happening with human development is we've moved from what he calls a concrete society, uh, which we can imagine kind of the tribal societies where you know everyone and kind of everybody knows each other and we trade on the basis of things like trust and the like. It's a concrete society. We've been moving from that toward a more abstract society where I don't have to know people on a personal level for me to be able to interact with them in important economic ways. I, I believe one example would just be if I get on the bus, I don't have to know the bus driver's name. I don't really have to know much about their life at all because I know the system in place gives them incentives to do their job right, to actually follow the path that they're supposed to follow to get me where I'm supposed to be roughly on time. Right? So by moving to this abstract society, it allows us to remake our relationships so that a lot of relationships that might matter in a concrete society don't really have to matter anymore. Right? My material well-being doesn't necessarily depend on me having good relationships with the people that I trade with on a regular basis. Right? So now what we see is because money's been taken out of the picture, there's this reversion from that abstract society back more toward a concrete society where we have to worry about what's my relationship with the quartermaster like if I want to get any of the stuff that they can provide to me. All right. I'm going further with this information in the role that it plays. Um, information is very closely connected to what we call search cost. Um, search cost is really just what it sounds like. Um, all of the resources, energy, time that goes into searching out the good that you uh, it's really one form of what we call a transaction cost, just being the set of costs involved with making a transaction possible. So that would include not just search costs, but things like negotiation cost as well, any resources you use to negotiate. Um, so it ends up that um, without these thick markets like we have now, um, search costs get very significant. Right? I actually have to do a lot of work to find where is this thing. Right? So Nog's first trade, what it helped him to do is to decrease the search cost. Now, in the economy in which we live, um, we see lots of different parties out there where really the role they play is decreasing search cost. Wholesalers and retailers, certainly, a lot of what they're doing is decreasing the cost of searching for things. Right? I'm fairly confident that basically any type of food I want, I can go to a major grocery store and find it. I don't have to go to a million different possible suppliers in order to find this one particular good that may be difficult to find if I had to trace down who it was that produced it. Right. So what the retailer does is acts as the central clearinghouse right, that allows my search cost to be much lower. It's anything that I want, it's probably going to have there within that category. Um, Walmart being one example where basically anything you want, they're going to have something like it there inside the store. Search costs go very, very low right, when you're looking to buy something at Walmart. And so within our economy, we have all these structures in place specifically to decrease search costs. If we don't have to produce and we don't, if we don't have to trade, more importantly, I don't really have to search for things. So all these institutions that are in place to decrease search costs don't have a big role to play in the economics of Star Trek. So we end up back at square one where we have to gather the information ourselves and do the search, and it's a difficult thing to do. Nog, though, figures out how to make it a little bit easier. Um, even further, right, there's a conversation where um, Nog is updating Chief O'Brien with how they're going to get this graviton stabilizer. And it comes out that Nog is really acting based on a rumor. Right, that, okay, here's the USS Sentinel, has this graviton stabilizer, and he heard a rumor that they'd be willing to take a phaser in there for it. He's acting based on a rumor, not actual knowledge. Right? And naturally, Chief O'Brien is rather disturbed by this. Right? Now, where this, what this tells us is that in the absence of money, what we call the double coincidence of wants, it's the fact that for us to trade, I have to have what you want and you have to have what I want, it gets very tricky. Right? Because for us to be able to trade, if we're trading direct goods, 
I would have to find, as an economist, as a professor of economics, I'd have to find a farmer that's willing to provide me with, I don't know, say apples or carrots or something like that, and in turn wants economics lessons. It's probably going to be hard to do. Uh, I doubt that there are many farmers that care a lot about lectures about economics. And so it's going to be difficult for me to actually make that match happen, right? for me to find that person that's willing to provide these various things that I need for survival in exchange for something that I have. So it's very tricky to get this double coincidence of want. So we end up having to do things like acting on rumors. In the presence of money, though, things get much easier. Because we can basically make the assumption that everyone has access to at least some money, um, and everyone would kind of like to have money, because you can use money to buy whatever you want. Right? So I can sell my economics lectures to students, right? students who are there trying to get you know, some kind of education so that in the end they can go out and perhaps get better jobs. I happily take their money, right? and then I can take that money and buy the various things that I need, carrots and apples and water and what have you. And so this double coincidence of wants becomes much easier, precisely because everyone has some common want, that is money. Just offer me enough, and I'm willing to sell you virtually anything you might want, as long as I have it available. And so, again, we see that role that information is playing. With money, we don't have to have as much information. Without money, information is far more critical. Um, a third insight that comes out of this episode is the need for a chain of trades in this barter system. Right, so if we have barter and we can't actually find, say, that farmer that wants an economics lesson, I may have to set up a chain of trades to get it to happen. Right, so I find somebody that does want an economics lesson that might possibly offer something that the farmer wants. Right, so I have to go through this chain in order to get the thing that I actually want. In this case, the specific thing that we saw happen was that we had one person wanted a photo with a desk, right, with the Captain Cisco's desk, because he's a famous captain and I collect photos of myself sitting at their desks. Right, so we have to send the desk off to them, right, basically renting it to them, in exchange for the induction modulator. What that does, I'm not sure. I assume that it modulates the induction of something. Right? But it's a, the important part, though, is that it's not what it does, but that I can trade it in exchange for the phaser emitter. What that does, presumably emit phasers. Also, not important, what matters is that I can trade it to get the graviton stabilizer, which is ultimately what I want. Right? So I have to go through this chain of a number of trades to finally end up with the thing we want. In the monetary system, I don't have to do as many trades. If, in fact, we had somebody that wanted this photo with this desk, and that's something I can provide and don't mind providing, just make sure that I ask them for enough money, and we do that trade. Then I can take that money, use it to buy the Graviton Stabilizer, and I'm done. It's far easier. We're cutting down the number of transactions. So that means that all the costs that go along with transactions, things like search costs, get substantially lower when we have the monetary system. And so money, once again, is coming in to make our lives easier right? by cutting out a lot of these steps that we'd have to go through in the absence of money. Uh, a fourth insight is about the great material continuum, which is this beautiful metaphor that the Ferengi have. Uh, and Nog tells us the great material continuum binds us all together. As we know, that there are planets out there, each of which have too much of some things, but not enough of another. So our job then as Ferengi is to go and basically sail on this great river of the great material continuum, taking things from where there's too much to where they, where that same thing is in a not enough kind of state. And this sounds very much like the law of association. And that's the fact that people tend to be more productive if we work together, because each of us has a different set of skills. And therefore, each of us is better at producing some things than others. So when I go out producing what I'm good at, I get too many economics lessons, somebody else gets too many apples, and then we can trade. And that's exactly what the Great Material Continuum seems to be. It's really just this description of how differences right, between the resources that are available in different places right, leads to trade, which in turn binds us all together. And so we specialize in whatever our area of comparative advantage happens to be, and then we trade to get what we actually want. And what I love about this is that it ties to the fact that trade builds bonds between people. Right? If I'm trading on a regular basis with someone, I want them to do well. I don't want to attack them. I want them to continue to prosper because it is through their prospering that I get what I need. Right? 
Um, so similarly, other people want me to prosper if they need what I am providing. Right? So it does, in fact, bind us all together and lead us to, I guess, having a shared community. Even with people we may not know face to face, I still want people to succeed if they're producing the things that I want. And so even in this non-monetary Starfleet, I would note, people do specialize based on their expertise and then end up trading services directly. Like you watch this in any of the Star Treks. Uh, we know that each person has a specific role they're going to fulfill. That's a division of labor. And then by working together as a team, right, we end up with a better outcome than if each of us was just kind of off on our own. And so even in the non-monetary Starfleet, it looks like people are still seeing that there is a gain to specializing and then trading services directly between each other. Right? So the doctor provides um, kind of medical services to the crew, and the crew in turn makes sure that the ship continues operating right? so that we have life support and can transport to whatever places we need to go. And so we do see this direct trade of services within Starfleet crews. Okay. So there again, we can see where trade is building bonds between people even on very large starships where you might not know everybody personally. But there is one point where I think insight number four starts to kind of go awry. Uh, when you listen to Nog's description, right, the great material continuum is described almost like the force in Star Wars, right, where it's just kind of this energy field that encompasses all living things and binds us all together and flows amongst us. That's not really the true way that it works if we understand the great material continuum as really just being a metaphor for trade. Trade is driven by people, whether those people be human, Bajoran, Perengi, Cardassian, whatever. But trade is driven by people. And it's people that are binding us all together through deciding to trade and specialize and do all of these things. That's what binds us together. Um, so I think the problem is treating it like it's totally separated right, from the people that are making choices right, within this universe. Um, I would note that we actually see the same kind of thing happen too often in just standard economic theory. Uh, often you might hear people treat supply and demand um, as kind of these mystical forces that push prices around, right? which it's not really true. Right? Supply and demand are really about describing how sellers and buyers act. So when I talk about how oh, supply is changing, what we really mean is sellers are changing their willingness in terms of their willingness to provide this good for particular prices. It's not just some impersonal force that's moving things around. It's individual people that are making choices, and that's leading to these changes. Okay. And so just kind of summing up what are the major insights we can pull out of this, um, I really think that this episode, Treachery, Faith, and the Great River, it really highlights... Um, first, obviously, the role of money in reducing things like search costs and information requirements. Now, we know in our economy, thanks to having money and thanks to having these various institutions that are there to facilitate, facilitate trade, wholesalers, retailers, and the like, we don't need to worry about search costs as much. They're, they're going to be lower. We don't need to worry about information requirements as much. They're going to be lower. Thanks to money and thanks to these institutions. But in the absence of money, suddenly these things become much more important. Also, what's the role of money in allowing an abstract society? With money, now these personal relationships don't matter as much. Right? I can spend my time getting to know people that I just happen to like being around without having to worry about having good relationships with those that are providing things that I need. Also, um, trade is a, mind, a means of binding us all together, right? that, that metaphor of the great material continuum. Now here I do want to bring up the other storyline, we spend a good deal of this episode in terms of time. Uh, we get pictures of the Dominion and what it is that binds them together, because they're not bound together in the same way. Right? Instead, it appears that the way the Dominion is held together um, is first by genetic engineering, and that the founders, right, the changelings, have genetically engineered the Vorta um, in order to be fiercely loyal to them and see them as gods. And that's just genetic engineering that did it. That is what put them in the proper place. It's no choice about you know, trying to trade things and benefiting from each other's existence. No, the Vorta are purely subservient right, to the founders and are just genetically engineered so they don't mind. Right? Um, then you have uh, the Jemadar, it's worse, right? The soldiers 
are all you find out throughout the series basically they're all on addictive drugs um you hear it mentioned ketracel white is the name of this drug which they can only get from the dominion right? and what you find out that um this drug is so important that it basically provides everything they need to survive. You take the Ketra cell white away and the Jem'Hadar will die. And so we have one class of people is genetically engineered to worship the founders. Another class of people that has been put on these ad addictive drugs from the time they're born, right? so that they also have to be loyal, otherwise they end up having that removed and they die. Right? So it's a totally different um, dynamic in terms of how society works. And here it is definitely um, on the basis of coercion of force and how these things are working. It's at the threat of your life that you are have, having to serve the dominion. And we have this hierarchical system right? divided up, like we mentioned before, along species lines. Right? Everyone having a defined role just based on their birth. Now you also find out in this episode um, that at the moment it's also being bound together to some degree by deception that there is this disease that's spreading amongst the founders. And it's very important, first, that we cover that up. Um, secondly, it's also very important that, um, in this case, we have Wei-Yun, who's trying to hunt down Odo right, and kill him off because he's not a loyal founder. But he would get in serious trouble uh, if it was found out by the, fa by the other founders that Odo had been killed. So it's also important to the survival of the Dominion the, the Vorta kind of cover up what they're doing um, whenever they may be going away from orders a little bit. Okay. Right. So we see now one society right, in the Federation being bound together by a division of labor, um, and then the Ferengi bringing to that right, this idea of trade is binding people together. The opposite being the Dominion bound together by deception, genetic engineering, and addictive drugs. And so I think we get an interesting contrast when we look at these two societies side by side, as we can see in this episode. Right, so just then to highlight kind of what we're going to do next week before we move into the Q&A. Um, next week, we're going to plan to watch an episode from Battlestar Galactica, the reimagined version of the series. Um, season 2, episode 14 is called Black Market. Um, I know that you can get it from Google Play for $1.99. Um, I know you can also get it for standard on standard definition, um, from iTunes similarly. I'm sure there are other places you can get it too. Um, really we're going to focus then on what happens when we take these markets that Nog knew how to use and force them underground. How does that change things in the dynamic of the way society works? So with that let's move into some Q&A. Thank you so much uh, Dr. Englehart. All right if you'd like to ask a question you can ask in text in the upper right, or if you'd like to ask on uh, on mic or even on video, if you really really want to, you can click the little raise hand feature at the at the top of the screen there, and I'll be able to uh, uh, to enable your webcam and mic. So uh, one of the things you pointed out that I hadn't really thought about uh, is the juxtaposition between kind of the federation way of you know socialist it it ah socialism ish but voluntary exchange as opposed to coercion and this kind of just very this empire that's built on everything that's evil and i i think uh one of the the insights you can draw from that like you can see how you know in the, the Federation, people have to do things for one another to get each other to... Ah, I'm not doing so well with the words tonight. Um, uh, but it, you, you have to fill someone's needs in order to have your own needs met. Whereas in, in, the, uh, in, in the Dominion stuff that you see, you, there's a lot more of this kind of... Uh, politicization you're you're kind of trying to suck up to people or even deceive them as to your in, intentions to get them to think that you're not terrible and shouldn't be killed I, and I think that uh, there's some parallels there to what uh, Hoppe talks about in in his paper of the uh, about uh, the divided uh, Germany 
and how that kind of had an effect on on the psyche of the people. Um, I thought that was very interesting. Good insights. Actually, you mentioning oh. the like the kind of socialist federation just reminded me. Um, just this week, uh, I ran into. Uh, it might actually be a new article on Reason.com about the five mm -hmm. worst. Um, I guess the five worst TV series from libertarians' perspective. Did, did you see that? Yeah. Yeah. I saw that they put out a track. call for people's suggestions. Yeah, it was, uh, I think it was. Wasn't their original series, or at least that was in the picture. I'm not sure. I paid a whole lot of attention when I clicked on that link. Yeah, yeah. I just they said the list, so. worst series for libertarians. I saw Star Trek on the picture. I was like, oh come on. Right. But uh. Yeah, that might be a bit much. But, you know. Yeah, I, I, I think that uh, mm -hmm. certainly we could we can find some much worse series. I mean. I was a, a fan of 24 before I became a libertarian, and now it's just completely impossible for, for me to watch it. It's... Sure. All sure. right, uh, no questions so far. I guess you were just that thorough, or uh, I know we've got some repeats in there. They might have gotten their questions answered uh, last time. Right. Um, oh, I do see here Andrew Stover mentions in the chat whether we discuss the effects of matter application toward a post-scarcity ah, yeah. society, which I, I don't think I quite directly mentioned that, um, but it is, we did talk about some of that connection um, where the, the replicator yeah, definitely changes the way that the economy works. Um, one, I guess, real-world example of people that are kind of trying to think that way um, would be the Venus Project and um, zeitgeist, right? really seeing us moving in this direction where really we don't have to work anymore, the machines handle everything, and so we basically have a Star Trek universe. Um, I think they're wrong for a number of reasons. And, and scarcity is a lot harder to get rid of once you understand what it actually means. Um, yeah, but I definitely think that a lot of the way things are built in Star Trek, and there was some discussion of this in the chat before we even started, Socialism is different in a post-scarcity society, and I think it's fair to say it might be more excusable. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't appear that and, you know, anybody in the society is really hating it and is forced to stay, or at least not much. And I, 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 uh, I actually got, before I was a libertarian, certainly, I, I had a, kind of a basic understanding of the economics of scarcity, and I was like, oh, well, well, maybe in a we could have a socialist society if we had reached kind of that point where replicators could provide everything. But actually, uh, one of your papers gave me a really good answer to that objection. To oh well, what if we just have computers that could calculate everything? Would you like to talk about that for a moment? Because it's also a really good answer to if you have any Venus Project or Zeitgeist friends. Man, uh, Lucas's paper is excellent for them. Sure. Not that sure. they'll read it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right, right. Um, now that one, it's... Um, yeah, the, the title of the paper is Central Planning's Computation Problem, uh, which yeah, I wrote kind of inspired by the Venus Project and also inspired by, I guess... The work that I've done using computational economics, um, which if you do computational economics very long, you realize that computers are really bad at running economies because they take a really long time to simulate a really simple economy. So let alone trying to actually process all the information in the real world. Um, so really what the paper is about is doing the math and saying if we simplify things a lot, just given the quantity of information, how long would it take to have the, super, the top 500 supercomputers working together, how long would it take them to just do the math for an economy the size of the world, which is really the vision that Zeitgeist and the Venus Project have, is making this a worldwide system. So I said, okay, let's make a simple problem. We're distributing 80,000 different goods, which is roughly twice as many as, as are in an average grocery store. Um, and we have, I think I simplified it to six billion people, I think with each individual preferences. Um, and it would take a very long time, um, so long that the time that has passed since the Big Bang would be enough to do a very, very small fraction of 1% of the calculation that would be required. Um, 
which of course creates rather practical concerns with how we're going to do the math. Um, yeah, so as soon as I did this, that no, no, it's just not possible. Uh, and in that paper, I actually go a little bit further and say, let's suppose that we adopt um, the quantum computers being kind of the next phase that we think is possible, which is a lot faster. Still, it's exceptionally slow given the amount of information that would be required. So it's just not going to be practical. Yeah, that's a, an excellent answer. I think it was uh, Hayek who um, kind of admitted, and now we know uh, he, he shouldn't have, that, okay, maybe with computers we'll, mm -hmm. we'll get to a point where a lot of planning could be done with computers. But, yeah, apparently uh, we will not get to that point. Right. Uh, now, uh, Scandal asks, did Roddenberry ever talk about the roots of his post-scarcity society? It seems very Engelsian. Hmm. I honestly don't know. Yeah, I, I really don't know where he got that from. Um, I guess I'm, I'm willing to doubt that he thought too much about it, to be honest. <laughs> I guess, like, what I have heard from him is in some of the I guess innovations you see in Star Trek, um, a lot of them are just to kind of get things to work on, on TV, right? So things like the teleporter technology, this transporter working. Um, really what that was about was that it would be really expensive in the effects to have shuttles landing and taking off all the time. So it was much easier to just have them appear on the planet. So he decided that that's what technology did. I wouldn't be surprised if he kind of took a similar approach with things like the replicator and thinking, well, getting food out in space is going to be hard. Let's say we have a device that can just make food when you're in space, and there we go. I wouldn't be surprised if that wasn't a big philosophical concept for him. If it was just solve a very practical problem. Uh, my browser crashed, sorry about that. Uh, we have a, a question uh, from Mighty Mag. Uh, do you have any suggestions for re resources for brand new libertarians who have just about zero concept of economics, like economics for a 30-year-old who didn't take any economics courses? Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, I think probably the best book there would be Henry Hazlitt's Economics in One Lesson. It's I think the first place to start. Um, yeah, the book is a little bit old. I think it was written right after World War II, if I recall correctly. Um, weirdly, though, pretty much all of the issues he talks about are still coming up. Um, the numbers that he is talking about are a little bit bigger now. If you look at the total corporate profit, it's bigger than what he talked about then. Um, but still, the same ideas are being bandied about, and I think he does a good job clarifying issues um, really in just one lesson. And showing how that shows up lots of places. Yeah. Absolutely. I know uh, fee. Dot, uh, it, you can find uh, the Foundation for Economic Education at fee.org. They just uh, did a new reformatting of Hazlitt's Economics in One Lesson, and they put the, I think, the ebook, the PDF, and the audiobook all on one page, so you can get it all in one place there at fee.org. And I've put that in the chat there. Um, and I also certainly for resources, if you're a member of liberty.me, we've got a lot of great stuff in the library, and we've also got some stuff in the guides. And then we have a lot of sessions here at Liberty Me Live that are kind of very basic, very intro. Um, uh, Mighty Mag uh, clarifies that you know he had problems with some of the the definitions, so he was going to. Google for definitions. Right. Uh, definitely, if you have issues like during a class in chat, we can uh, like just ask what something means in chat. And certainly, uh, there are always a lot of people in here who are really helpful with that. But like, if you have specific questions, like something that you want to learn, a, a specific issue that you want to learn about, feel free to discussion on liberty.me uh, slash discuss. People are always happy to, to help you out there. There are a lot of good uh, resources at FEE, a lot of good resources at Mises.org. There's just a lot of stuff out here. So we're, oh, and uh, Mighty Mag is a she. Sorry about that. 
uh, mighty just sounded. Uh, sorry, that's that's my bias there. Uh, we're, there yeah, <laughs> yeah I'm, I'm, what can I say? I'm making. I, I'm supposedly a feminist, and yet I say things like this. Oh darn. Um, but yeah, we're, we're always ha happy to help out, and if you've got some something that you'd like to learn about here at Liberty.me, we can always like get a session on it. Like we we just recently uh, had a series of three sessions on the socialist calculation debate with uh, G P Manish, and the videos are in our in our archive. That was like a really really great and from basics to intermediate intro. Uh, on that topic, you could go from just the very, very basic stuff of like learning about the subjective theory of value to really understanding. And uh, he applied the the calculation problem to to the policies of India in its most socialist period. So that was a really good intro on that topic. We can get you intro intros on other topics. We're always happy to help. Um, let's see. Do we have? Any other questions? I'll put out a last call and let people know what's going on here at Liberty.me Live this week. Uh, Thursday or Wednesday night, we have a session with Cal Molinay. He does a monthly thing called Fight the Matrix, where he he talks about kind of the assumptions that we make in the system and how we can communicate to non-libertarians and how we can even answer some of the questions that we might have about liberty and that's that's a really great thing it happens once a month it's happening Wednesday night at 9 p.m. Eastern and then Thursday we've got two sessions at 2:30 we've got the I believe the fifth session of Jeffrey Tucker's uh, really great class on uh, the life and work of Ludwig von Mises and I believe he's going to be talking about Mises on the business cycle and kind of going over how how the theory developed and the interactions with Hayek and stuff. It's going to be really great. And then at 8 p.m., uh, we're releasing an, a new book by Isaac Morehouse called Better Off Free, and he's going to do a, a an author's forum here at Liberty.me um, on the, the topic of that book. He's always a lot of fun. If you've never seen him speak, definitely check that out. Then Saturday night, we've got Rachel Mills in for another episode of Rachel Mills Live, which is a, a bi-monthly thing or a bi-weekly thing that we, we do around here. And I'm not sure who her guest is going to be, but she always has fun people. She used to have a show called Liberty with Rachel, if you are if you were familiar with that. Uh, Andrew Stover has a question. Um, are there any organic redundancies in Star Trek operations that you would imagine in the future wouldn't actually exist? It seems like there are many officer jobs that are entirely unnecessary, you know, red shirts, um, in, a, in a recent Singularity podcast, I listened to how they speculated that humans and machines would evolve together, and it would it seemed to be a pretty much the idea that society would organize around the machines to make them work, and we would augment them by doing articulate work. That's probably the longest question we've had in chat here. <laughs> right. No, but it's a good question, right? And yeah, I think that is something that does appear to be a weakness, right? That it appears that you know, technology can handle all of these problems, but we still have to send actual organic life forms into battle or, or down on these away missions rather than just scouting another way. And what, in Star Wars, we have to send in droids to scout. So yeah, that's actually a very good question. Uh, yeah, again, I don't know if that's something there's a lot of thought put into that fact. Um, yeah, yeah. It, it is interesting. I'm just thinking more. I, I listen to the Econ Talk podcast a lot, and one of the things they talk about a lot um, is kind of what's the relationship between machines and human beings. And it's, it's kind of been a theme recently. And I was very interested to find out that apparently one thing we do very well compared to machines is dealing with, I guess, fluid reality that's not totally predictable. Right? So I, I guess there, there might be maybe some gains there. When you're actually down on the ground, it is actually easier for you know, a living human form or whatever um, to, say, walk over ground that might not be perfectly flat. Whereas you put down a rover and it, it's very expensive to get it to deal with variations in the way the topography is. 
So it might possibly be something like that they have in mind. Um, yeah, but it's it's kind of odd that we've not solved a lot of those technical problems in the next 400 years. <laughs> maybe it's uh, maybe maybe their union requirements. You have to have at least uh, two red shirts per away mission, something like that. Yeah, that'd be believable. <laughs> Oh, that's more All right. Babylon Five approach, I think. Ah, uh, yeah. Well, we'll I think that that wraps it up for us for tonight. Uh, I actually looked just a little bit earlier on YouTube for the uh, the episode for next time, Black Market from uh, from uh, Battlestar Galactica, and it looks like there is a copy on YouTube, so you can see it there if you just really don't like HD or are cheap. It's totally cool, uh, and I'm sure that there might be other black market ways to find black market. So uh, definitely check us out here next week, same time, right here at Liberty Me Live. Thanks so much for coming, uh, Lucas, and we're totally happy to, uh, to have you. Uh, we were, uh, I'm sorry we had to redo this session, but it was awesome once again. So thanks so much, everyone. Take care and have a great night.